Hey everybody, I'm Anna J. Walner, host of the Independent Author Chat channel on YouTube, and I am ecstatic to be joined today by Tim Cagle, who is not only an attorney, but has three amazing books out, two medical thrillers, and one based on his time in Nashville as a singer-songwriter. Tim, do you want to take it away? Well, Anna, thank you for the kind words. I'm very delighted to be here. I think what you're doing is absolutely wonderful, and it's a pleasure to join you. So I'm thank here to you. tell you whatever you'd like me to say and whatever you'd like to talk about. It's up to you. I want to get to know more about you as an author, um, as a, as an attorney, how that helped to inspire you to write the books that you have that have a, 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 a the, the medical um, legal thriller theme to them. And really, it's all about you, whatever you'd like to talk about uh, with your books and your journey to become an author. All right, well, thank you then. All right, so I'll, I'll do my best not to bore people, but being a lawyer, I know that's an occupational hazard. So I'll, I'll try not to do that. Uh, I started writing basically as a release. I, uh, I, I got out of law school many years ago, unfortunately, uh, as I told you earlier, this is kind of like breakfast with grandpa. I'm a lot older than you are, but I, I got out of law school in the 70s. I started my practice and then I decided something was missing and I did what I always wanted to do. I shut my practice down. I went to Nashville to write country songs. And it was a dream come true till I got there. And then the dream wasn't as, nearly as dreamy as I thought it would be, but I had some fun. Uh, I found a songwriting partner, a great actress, and uh, we wrote some songs together. We had a shot at getting a, a track and a, a, a star's comeback. Unfortunately, the deal fell through. It was a couple of years later. And I said, you know, uh, as I, as much as I, it's appealing that romantic side about being the poor starving artist, I'd much rather make a living and have some money again. So I came back from Nashville to the Boston area and started my practice up again and, and then did what I wanted to do in law and that's become a malpractice, medical malpractice, products, liability, wrongful death lawyer. And I've and done that very for successful. many, well, yeah, many decades I've, uh, I've had the I've had the pleasure and also the sorrow of representing many catastrophically injured patients. And imagine. there's some very, very sad people out there. I think I started writing the thrillers uh, because of all the people I couldn't help. There, people would come to me and just because someone's hurt, I used, to, I used to teach evidence and I would tell my class, just because someone's hurt doesn't mean someone else is responsible. And I would get people who who had some incredibly sad stories, but the law was against us or the facts were against us or both. And I couldn't help them. And that really started to weigh me down because my heart really went out to those people. I felt really bad. And there was nothing I could, I, I never forget. One woman came to me and she went in for a laparoscopy, which they put a scope into the abdomen and they wanted to look around and see, tried to get the cause of her uh, abdominal distress. While they were in there, they nicked the artery and she almost bled to death. So they had to call in the vascular surgeon who uh, looked this over and it wound up, they couldn't get the surgeon in time and he nicked the artery and she basically lost patency, which means the blood flow would not come in. So they had to give her an arterial graft. And the problem was Every 18 months to two years, the graph had to be replaced. She was only in uh, her 30s. She couldn't pick her kids up anymore. She couldn't, uh, her life had basically changed. I mean, it's not like she was paralyzed, but she was in her, her own well, kind of hell. Absolutely life changing. Oh, no, I'm telling and, and the law said it was what's called, quote, an acceptable risk of the surgery. And that, that those things happened and you can't hold the doctor liable. And those kind of things started to get to me. Oh, so I, I started imagine. to write the thrillers and um, that helped me get through. I mean, I was not somebody who really wanted to use alcohol as a crutch or drugs or anything else. I wanted to see what I could do. So I, my 
thriller writing is be- dedicated to the clients I could not help. And my oh, the other the first book I wrote was about my experience in Nashville. That was for me because that <laughs> was a fun time. And if I could have done it, I you know, uh, I understand you're a Texan and my favorite yep. Texans are Willie and Waylon. And believe me, uh, th- that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. I wanted to sing. I wanted to have some fun. And uh, I kind of got to do it, but not the way I wanted to. Today, uh, about the most fun thing I do related to music, I've got two teenage daughters as neighbors, and I've been giving them guitar lessons for a few years, and I got to tell you, me and two teenage girls, that's a whole new world. That's one that you can't even conceive. George Orwell would have no idea what this type of world was, because they are unbelievable. They say things that are so funny you can't laugh and they have no idea. And the best part of it is I try to teach them to my music and and they they say to me, what are these minuets? Or where where are these people coming from? I say, yeah, but you you, got to hear this by Sam Cooke and you got to hear this by Creedence Clearwater Revival. You got to listen to this by by the Eagles. And they go, who are these people? We want to hear Taylor Swift. And I go, okay, fine. And so I tried to teach him one song and I said, all right, girls, I'm not sure how to interpret this lyric. He don't like me much in high heels. I said, so if either of you can help me with that, you know, I said, because if I were going to wear the high heels, they'd be size 13. And I'm not sure that's the look you want either. So, but anyhow, that's about what I do with, with music at this point, but I'm still writing and most of the, the most intense novels are the ones that involve the uh, medical legal thrillers. So. But I don't think you can ever get away from the artist inside of you. So being an author for me is something that I will always do. And I have a feeling that you'll always have a place in in your life and in your heart. You, tell me that you don't still pick up your guitar and sing and write music. Anna, you know, the only thing that stops me, I got arthritis in my fingers. Oh. These, these two are bent. And I still play, even though it hurts like you can't believe. In fact, I went to see the hand surgeon yesterday, and he thinks maybe he can help release it. But but this is what keeping me from doing it, because it's the most fun I ever had. It really and truly was. And so, yes, you're 100% right. But without the teenage girls that are when, telling me, you're making that chord wrong. I mean, I gave him lessons for six months, and the 16-year-old said, I don't think you're playing the F the way it ought to be. And I said, well, well, tell me what that means. He says, well, I think if you take a little finger and you put it this way, you do like this. And I would go, well, you think I'm doing it wrong? She said, absolutely. And I said, but what if you want it? And she said, well, I don't care. I don't think you're doing it right. And I said, well, let me call Eric Clapton and Vince Gill and Don Felder from the Eagles and a few of those guys and say, you know, for years we've been doing this wrong, but I got a 16 year old kid has corrected us. So we're safe. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So yes. <laughs> well, so you've uh, you've done the the two the two uh, medical thriller books, and then the one that I know is close to your heart. Um, that's based on your time as a musician. Do you have anything that you're working on now that you can talk about? I do. I've got two. Okay. One of each. I've got one that I wanted to do when I started, but I couldn't figure out how to plot it. And I'm pretty close now. I've got a Vietnam vet who comes back, uses the GI Bill to become a plastic surgeon. And then years later, he is accused of identity theft and murder when he was 17. And that that one keeps me going because there's a lot of things. And it's loosely based on a Garth Brooks tune because he was in an orphanage and uh, there's a Garth Brooks song called uh, That Summer about uh, she was a lonely teenage, a lonely widowed woman hell bent to make it on her own. And so he goes to work on this farm and there's a complicated relationship. And the second one I got is a seventies band that reunites and they're all their business careers are in their twilight. So they're in their late fifties, early sixties. And the leader is a woman named Coco who's a Latina lady and who just was, she was J-Lo in the 70s. I mean, that's how good she was, but things didn't work out. And now they're having a reunion in Nashville from a star's estate who left them some things. 
And so that keeps me going. So between that one and the Vietnam vet, it kind of keeps me going in two directions. And when I work on one and I go work on the other one, it, 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 it's what's really fun in my life at this point, you know? So I, uh, I heard you mention, see, I, um, I personally am what they call a, what the writing community calls a panther. So I start my, my, my books, my chapters, and I kind of let the characters take me where they want to go. But for a medical thriller or a legal thriller, there has to be a process that you go through to, because the, the, um, the intricacies and just the, um, the, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, the. Plot twist. Uh, yes, but the, the, the actual knowledge that you have as an attorney for the, the judicial process itself. That's true. Uh, you have to really sit down and, and write those, those scenes out in a, in a plotted way. Yeah. And well, the other thing is, too, I have to know enough medicine to make it plausible. I mean, I can't just yeah. make up things. And unfortunately or fortunately, I've cross-examined enough doctors that uh, I, I kind of got an idea. And I now with the internet and everything, the research is just incredible. But I've seen doctors explode on the witness stand when they're called to account for things. And I mean, because doctors a lot of times don't like to be quite, I mean, none of us do, but they yeah. don't especially because they've got all this training and they're bright people and all this dedication. And now somebody is calling them to account for things. And a lot of them don't like it, but I've seen them explode when they were being called to account and asked questions. Uh, I mean, I've had doctors yell at me in court, which that's fine. Uh, I've had doctors that really get upset, but you know, it, it's the client that you got to, take care of and you got to make sure that the client has to be served properly but the medicine I always try to make sure that is precise because I think it's an unforgivable sin if I write something that isn't absolutely precise and done properly as far as the court proceedings yeah I've got plenty of experience to do that with depositions and trials and all that stuff uh, in fact th the two thrillers I have one the first one was called unexpected enemy it's about a woman who goes to an infertility doctor because she has trouble conceiving and she winds up giving birth to an interracial child. And surprise. Yeah, yeah, I mean, very surprised. And I mean, you can imagine what kind of reaction that is because I mean, if you go through all that trouble to conceive and then you wind up getting the wrong sperm, that's unbelievable. And, and in fact, the, this is kind of based on my wife and I went through infertility treatment. And so I went through this stuff and I saw, her. I remember being in a waiting room one day and there were about seven or eight guys in there with me and we're all of different backgrounds, different races, different colors, different creeds. And I thought, what happens if my wife doesn't get my sperm? What if she gets somebody else's? And I thought, what do you do? And I thought, you know, I'm a products liability lawyer, but this isn't like if your accountant does your taxes wrong. I mean, you can file an amended return. Mm -hmm. If your mechanic doesn't do your brake job right, you can get it fixed. This is a baby. Yeah. And how do you fix that? And that gave me the idea. And then I put it all together and what I wanted to do. So, But the second one, based on the time I played football in Kansas in the 60s and the civil rights era. And that's based on its two lawyers, one black, one white, college roommates, football All-Americans in the civil rights era. They reunite in Boston and they go to trial against a heart surgeon that's accused of implanting a defective pacemaker. Maker. And yeah, this, this is set in 1994. So it's like 30 years after they uh, were in college together. And, and then that they also then moved to Nashville and started their entertainment division in their firm. But so I had a lot of that was dedicated to some guys I played football with. Some That's a little bit of a crossover Army. of everything. It is. Yeah. I mean, but the same stuff applies. I mean, I went through all that stuff. I mean, I had a good friend in college. We used to argue music every chance we could. We had a 
huge, huge argument about whether David Ruffin of the Temptations had a better voice than El Elvis. And I, I said to him, no, no, no. And he said this, and I said that, and we were going in. And finally, he grabbed me by the shoulders, and he looked, and he said, listen to me. No matter what you say, we can debate music for the next century, and white people will never come up with a challenger to Aretha Franklin. And I said, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You absolutely right. That ended the argument. We both walked away, shook hands, been friends ever since. Sometimes yeah. it's best to agree to disagree. Absolutely, because that was that was the stunner. That would really got me because he was right. So, you know, and I think, you know, race is such a contentious issue in this country. I don't know why. I don't know why it has to be. I got one line in the book that said the two characters are talking to each other, and one said, you know, we got along because we never saw being black or being white. We saw it as a circumstance of existence, not a character trait. And if people just realize that all of us, we all have the same problems. We all have the same things. We might look at things differently, but inside we got good people and we got bad people. That's what the division is. It's not colors, not religion, it's not race, it's not politics. It's just difference. But you can do that and still coexist. And so I felt this book needed to be written too. And I, I've had uh, some friends of both races that like this because they remember going through similar stuff. Uh, so, but I mean, I remember when we played in Arkansas. I mean, you know, this wasn't long after the uh, incident at uh, Little Rock with the, the, they had to send troops in to get the schools integrated. I was I going to when, say, you yeah. were around when, yeah. uh, when integration was was occurring so oh, uh, james was meredith great. was 62 in mississippi he was the first you black remember. man to integrate oh miss i do i remember all this stuff selma was in 1965 i mean i remember you that that the way it was that blacks couldn't eat in certain restaurants they couldn't use the same restrooms they couldn't i mean the laws were unbelievable the worst time was we had a friend that who died in Vietnam, they shipped his body back in here and they couldn't bury him in a cemetery because it was for all whites. And I, I think said, how about that be? how that was acceptable back then is just sickening now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I just don't know how it could have been like that. I just don't know, but it was. And so that's something we got to try to fix somehow. Uh, I absolutely agree. You know, um, yeah. But uh, you mentioned you you mentioned you mentioned that you played uh, in Kansas. Do you? Yes. Uh, my dad actually uh, went to. He grew up in a place called Independence, Kansas. Right by Coffeeville. Yeah, I guess I've, I've I've never been there myself. Yeah. But um, I I didn't know, and I think um, I think they just had a. Um, I don't know if you watch uh, some of the the on on Netflix um, the what is it uh, the the it's a it's a football uh, show that because I'm into football and I know you are too. Yeah, not Friday Night Lights. No, 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 no. It's 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 like a documentary, oh. um, and uh, there was one uh, where uh, where it took place in Independence. Kansas at the the college at the college there, but Independence um, Junior College. Yeah, Independence Junior College. That's where my dad. Uh, yeah. th that's where my dad is from. Is Independence, Kansas. Well, Anna, for me, you tell your dad as the wizard once said to Dorothy, "I'm an old Kansas man myself." Okay, so <laughs> you you tell him that. I always thought whenever um, whenever my dad would tell me about Kansas and all of that uh, that. I was like, where, as, as a kid, you know, you're like, um, I grew up, we, you know, I was born here in, in Houston and adopted. And um, my, my mother's family is really, really close, but Kansas just seemed like a hundred, like worlds away, uh, yes. way, 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 way north. And then you grow up and you realize it's not that far away. <laughs> no, it, but it, it's kind of like Oklahoma without the glamour, you know, something like that. So what, what, uh, you are traditionally published. Yep. And what, I, I know that's a, a, a dream that, uh, that, that I had in the very beginning and I decided to go the traditional publishing route or the, the self-published route, the independent yep. publishing route. 
what would you say uh, is one of the main benefits for people who are self-published? Uh, what would you say are some of the, the, the benefits that you've seen from being a traditionally published author? I think people that are independent would, would be interested in hearing some of the things that are different. I, I hope so. Um, you know, today there's a lot of different styles. There's subsidy publishing, there's traditional publishing, there's just self-publishing. Yeah. I think today, from what I see, and again, what I'm telling you is my understanding. It may be different than someone else's. The big publishers do what they've always done. And the rest of us, I, I'm not with the huge publishing houses, but, you know, the, the best, the big advantages I have, they design my cover. They come up with some really good things. They put together uh, the blur. I wrote the blur, but they put it all together. They help me. I do most of my own marketing because I just know what I want to say. Okay. And I don't know how much it works, but, you know, I'm happy with what I'm doing. And I think if, as a self-publisher, you'd have to design your own cover. You have to put it all together. You have to make sure that the printing house gives you exactly what you want. What do you do if it doesn't yeah. come out right? I had someone that bought one of my books and said the first 32 pages are missing or so. And he called up the distributor, got a new book it, with a Self-published, I don't know if you, what you have to go through to do that. So there's advantages to each. The best part was I kept my film rights. So I negotiated my deal that I get to keep my film rights. So they've got the book rights. So, the, you know, however many I sell, I got to pay them a, a fee. That's fine. But if I get an offer for a film deal, I get to negotiate that myself. And that's what I wanted to do because I retained it. So that was the big thing why I wanted. Have you had anyone reach out for I, a film? I had one or? guy, uh, but uh, as many things in life are, some people sound like Superman and perform like Plastic Man. Yeah. And he could not get the financing because we were, had a deal ready to go for that one about the uh, woman who got the wrong sperm. We had a deal all set and ready to go and it fell through because he couldn't get financing. And so. I think I remember actually, now that you, you brought that up, was there not an instance uh, not too many years ago where this did happen, where the, uh, the clinician himself, the doctor at the fertility clinic was indeed using his own um, I know that's been the plot on law, on law and Order in a couple of series. I don't know if that that's absolutely happened. I do know that there have been a multitude <laughs> of lawsuits. I remember one from Ohio about a lesbian couple that went in for infertility and one of the partners was uh, fertilized and claimed that she got the wrong sperm. But I, I don't know where there's one like this where that the woman gives birth to the interracial child. I don't know if it's gone that far, but it certainly could happen Probable. if somebody's not paying attention. That's the only thing, you know, and people sometimes don't pay attention. I've seen that for a lot of I, years. I have, uh, I have gotten blood test results back that have told me that I had an elevated um, iron level and I needed yep. to come in and be retested immediately. And uh, I've, I've come in and then they've retested me within a day. There's no way that that my iron levels would change and because I'm I'm typically anemic. So oh, yeah. to be elevated was quite a concern for my doctor. Sure. Absolutely. So I go back in and it turns out that um, that my test results had been um, mixed up with someone of a of a similar name. They called the wrong number or I'm not sure exactly what happened. So mistakes do happen. It's just when they're of a catastrophic nature that exactly. you you would take on those kinds of cases. And those are the kinds yeah. of cases that, that you've written about. Well, one of the worst cases I ever had was a two-month-old baby went in for a torsion testicle, which essentially means that the testicle died. So they went in to remove right. uh, one of the second-year residents was working with the attending, the residents with doctor in training, and he wound up trying to dissect out the spermatic artery and he cut the artery in half. 
They had to call oh. in a plastic surgeon to try to put it back together, but it didn't work. And to make a long story even longer, the child essentially yeah. operating room as a eunuch, he lost both testicles and basically had the had gender reassignment. I mean, yeah. that that's... It, you know, doctors are great people. Some are greater, some are not. Uh, but they make mistakes like everybody else. And that's why I said, your mechanic, they can make a mistake. Your tax attorney, they can make a mistake. You, but your doctor, I always told my class, we are held to a much higher standard, doctors and lawyers. Because when we make a mistake, it changes people's lives forever. So we have to pay attention. We don't have the option of saying, well, I think this is okay. No, we don't think it's okay. We're convinced it's okay. There's no shorter standard than I can't do it. So, Do you still provide expert testimony now that you're retired or you're completely out of the court? I'm out. I'm, out. I'm doing my best to <laughs> just uh, make it up to my wife for all those years when I uh, uh, was never around and try to have some fun together. As I say, we just sold our house. And so we're gonna move into an over 55 community. Of course, I always tell her she's got about 20 years to wait, but uh, before she turns 55. But, uh, you know, so I'm trying to make it up to her and just have a little fun because we, she was, uh, as I say, she was a high powered executive and we were both working 80, 90 hours a week for all those years. And now we are going to try to enjoy this if we ever get rid of this pandemic. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm myself. I'm looking forward to getting back to a semi-normal life, where okay. I can go take my daughter to the playground and let her interact freely with other children, which yes. she's kind of lacking right now. She has mostly mature company, um, except when sure. she sees her cousins, who are also. You know, we're, you have to be really, really careful. So uh, I'd, I'd love for her to be able to do gymnastics or something like that. It's just not not feasible right now. Or it's not advisable. Exactly. Right but hopefully they got some vaccines now. And hopefully that those are going to provide the safety and comfort we all need. And that that's going to work out fine. So I'm optimistic, I think. So. Fingers crossed that everything hopefully comes to an end and we can all as authors get back to get signing books in person. Right. And know? wreaking havoc on people on havoc on people through our words. Exactly. Can't wait to do that. <laughs> well, it's 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 been an honor and a privilege to have you join me today. I really thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule and uh and just hearing about everything that you've done in your life uh is amazing well uh, thank you anna and all i can say to you is as the great travis tritt once said i hope that you can put some drive in your country that it would be my fondest wish for you because that's when you're going to have some fun and the honor and the privilege was you. all mine thank you for inviting me this was really fun we oh, did okay. have a good time i think uh, I think so too. Absolutely. And I know that I did. And um, don't hesitate to I'll, I'll see you on Twitter, everybody. I'll have, uh, I'll have uh, Tim's links in the description below, as well as his, um, uh, uh, where you can follow him on Twitter and Wait. any other social media. If that's uh, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm on it all. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, that's you all have I can think. To, you Those have, are the you have main to be. Ones, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to be right now because, like, like exactly. we just, you know, there's no opportunity for for people to go to a bookstore and yeah. schedule. You can't time. interact with anybody, so social media is about it. I know. Yeah. I see people all the time asking for advice on marketing, and people say, "Go visit independent bookstores. Go do an in-person signing." And yeah. We need to update the way that we think about marketing now because it's it's completely changed. And I think that it may forever change the way that that authors market. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I think so. we'll see some permanent changes in in marketing and in life in general after we get through Hopefully, 2021 will be the end of, of yeah. this. 
but Let's I think hope. there will still be some lingering after effects that we'll have to deal with. Yeah. So. Well, good. Well, listen, say hi to your daughter for me and hang I in there. Will, I will. And thank you again for taking the time out to talk with me and everybody else. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss anything, uh, any, anybody else. And especially having guests like Tim, who is amazing to talk to and just had me in tears before we started recording, by the way, with laughing like crazy. I wish, uh, I, I wish, yeah. Well, I, the I, biggest I, compliment I ever got was they said, Are, you can't be a lawyer. Lawyers aren't funny. They're stuffy. You you have a good sense of humor and lawyers, they, they don't like to laugh about anything. You can only have their smiles when a check comes in. So, you know, I always try to strive to have a little fun. I'm do. glad that you said that because I was going to say um, I I worked um, briefly for a well not briefly I worked for four years um, uh, for a, a, a clinical psychologist who was who had to do um, I'm sure that you've employed uh, psychologists to do absolutely a, a, you know a a personality test or things like that to yes. establish competency or to be an expert witness for PTSD or things like that. So I've had a little bit of experience with attorneys and writing, um, helping to proofread uh, um, the, the doctor, uh, the psychologist's uh, reports on how the, the patient or the, the client was affected by what had happened. Right. And uh, you are by far <laughs> the most entertaining and non-uptight, non-stuffy attorney <laughs> that I've ever had the pleasure of talking with. Well, so. thank you. And, and listen, as far as uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, I used to tell my evidence class, if all psychiatrists and psychologists were laid end to end, they would not reach a conclusion. So I think that kind of sums up what we're talking about. You're absolutely on the money. <laughs> well, have a great rest of your day and thank you. All right, again. you too, and you take care. I will. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Anna. Take care.